Hey everyone, in this lesson we're going to talk about folliculitis. So we're going to talk about the causes of folliculitis, some risk factors, some of the signs and symptoms, and how we can diagnose it and how we can treat it. So if we look at the word folliculitis, if we were to break it down, the prefix follicle refers to follicles and the suffix itis means inflammation. So folliculitis is actually an inflammation of the superficial and or deep hair follicle due to infectious and non-infectious causes. In this lesson we're going to talk about the infectious causes. So again, it's an inflammation of a hair follicle. So the first category of infectious causes we're going to talk about is bacterial. So one of those is Staphylococcus aureus. This is actually the most common cause of folliculitis. The second bacteria that can cause folliculitis is Pseudomonas. If we have folliculitis due to Pseudomonas, this is known as gram-negative folliculitis. And it is commonly associated with hot tub use. So you might have heard of hot tub folliculitis. This is caused by Pseudomonas. Other bacteria that can cause folliculitis include Klebsiella and Proteus. The second category of infectious causes is fungal. And fungal causes are actually the most common organisms after Staphylococcus aureus. These include Malassezia species like Malassezia globosa, Dermatophytes can also cause folliculitis and candida albicans or yeast can also cause folliculitis as well. And the other category of infectious causes of folliculitis is viral causes. Viral causes include herpes virus infections like varicella zoster virus and herpes simplex virus 1 and 2. We can also see molluscum contagiosum virus also causing a folliculitis as well. So we're going to talk about all of these in detail in the next upcoming slides. But first, I want to talk about risk factors for getting folliculitis in the first place. Risk factors include hot tub exposure or hot tub use. So I talked about this before. Hot tub use is associated with pseudomonal infections. So you can get hot tub folliculitis or gram-negative folliculitis. Another risk factor is excessive sweating. So someone that is perspiring a lot is at an increased risk of getting folliculitis. Other risk factors include a blocked hair follicle. This makes sense. Folliculitis is an inflammation of the hair follicle. If it's blocked, you can get bacterial or other types of microorganisms growing in the hair follicle causing folliculitis. The fourth risk factor is chronic use of oral or topical steroids. So oral or topical steroids can lead to some immunosuppression. If it's topical, it could lead to some immune suppression in that localized area, leading to increased risk of folliculitis. Chronic use of oral or topical antibiotics. So using Antibiotics in certain areas can also affect some of the skin flora, increasing your risk for folliculitis. Shaving opposing the growth of a hair follicle. So this can cause some irritation if you're shaving against the hair follicle. This can cause some irritation, inflammation, and cause folliculitis as well. Scratching in the area can also do some similar things. Being of the male gender is also a risk factor for folliculitis and immunosuppression. So conditions that cause immunosuppression or other causes of immunosuppression can increase your risk for folliculitis. This is related to steroid use as well. What are some of the clinical features of folliculitis? So we'll break it down into bacterial, fungal, and viral folliculitis. So bacterial folliculitis have erythematous pustules. So they kind of look like little pimples. These can be pyritic, so they can be itchy. And they may be painful if they are affecting deeper structures of the hair follicle. Staphylococcus aureus is again the most common cause of folliculitis in general. And if you do have Staphylococcus aureus folliculitis, the scalp and the face are the most commonly affected. So your head is the most commonly affected by Staphylococcus aureus. If you have methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus or MRSA, these oftentimes will affect the chest and the trunk more often. And pseudomonal Bacterial folliculitis or hot tub folliculitis, as we talked about before, affects the trunk and the buttocks. And it usually is anywhere from 8 to 48 hours after exposure to a hot tub. So these all have very similar clinical features, but they can affect different parts of the body depending on the bacteria that's causing the folliculitis. The second category of cause we talked about is the fungal folliculitis. So this is also called pterosporum folliculitis. These also can be pyritic, so itchy, but what they are is normally monomorphic in their appearance. Monomorphic means they all look the same or they all look very similar. They can be papules or pustules. 
So they might be just raised red spots as opposed to the pustules that are pus filled. And they may also have an underlying plaque. A plaque is a raised skin lesion that is greater than one centimeter in diameter. So they may have an underlying plaque with papules on top of that plaque. So you might see something like that. And oftentimes, if you do see that underlying plaque, that is more often a dermatophyte infection, a dermatophyte causing the folliculitis. So something like in this image here. So raised area underneath, but then you also have these papules on top of that plaque. And with regards to fungal folliculitis, the neck, the back, and the shoulders are most often affected. So again, fungal folliculitis is puritic, so it's itchy and monomorphic in appearance, so the lesions all look the same, and the neck, back, and shoulders are the most commonly affected areas. With regards to viral folliculitis, viral folliculitis has a variety of different appearances. It may have papules, pustules, plaques, or vesicles. So papules are raised skin lesions that are less than one centimeter in diameter. Pustules are similar. They are raised erythematous, but are pus filled. So they have a white tip. Plaques are raised skin lesions that are greater than one centimeter and vesicles are fluid filled raised lesions. So they can be a variety of appearances with viral folliculitis. Skin lesions are often found in groups or clusters. So this all is associated with those herpes virus infections we talked about before. And in some viral folliculitis, you may see an umbilicated pustule. This is something we see in molluscum contagiosum infections. So something like this. So if you look here, these skin lesions here are umbilicated. They have a little, what we call a belly button. So you can imagine if these little lesions are affecting the hair follicle, it can lead to inflammation of the hair follicle, leading to folliculitis. So again, viral folliculitis, a variety of appearances depending on the virus that is causing it. You can see papules, pustules, plaques, or vesicles. Skin lesions are found in groups or clusters, most oftentimes with herpes virus infections, and the umbilicated pustules are the ones that are caused by molluscum contagiosum infections. How do we diagnose it and how do we treat folliculitis? So diagnosis depends on the infectious cause. So with regards to bacterial folliculitis, it's often just a clinical diagnosis. We take the history and we see the appearance of the skin lesions on the individual and we make the diagnosis just by doing that. With regards to fungal folliculitis, you can often do a KOH preparation, so a potassium hydroxide preparation and see hyphae. And with regards to viral folliculitis, you could do some skin scraping and check for PCR or look at it under the microscope, do some immunofluorescence. That may help you with the diagnosis as well. But again, most of these are all going to be diagnosed via clinical inspection. How do we treat folliculitis? So again, we separate it depending on the infectious cause. So bacterial folliculitis can use topical mupirocin or topical clindamycin. You can also use topical fusidic acid. If that's not helping and the topical treatment is not really doing its job, we could do oral dicloxacillin or cephalexin. For MRSA, we're going to have to use something else. We're going to have to use something like Septra, so a sulfa antibiotic. With regards to gram-negative folliculitis, a lot of times that hot tub folliculitis, it's self-limiting. We don't really have to do anything for it. So we just leave it and it often goes away by itself with proper hygiene. With regards to fungal folliculitis, treatment involves topical antifungals. That makes sense. Ketoconazole is one of those treatments. You could use oral fluconazole or itraconazole. And for dermatophyte folliculitis, we need to use some special antifungals like oral terbinafine and griseofolvin. For viral folliculitis, if it's herpes folliculitis, so we can see that characteristic grouped vesicular folliculitis, we can use acyclovir or valacyclovir. And for molluscum folliculitis, we can use cantharidin or cryotherapy. So we can use liquid nitrogen on those folliculitis lesions if it's caused by molluscum contagiosum virus. So again, diagnosis in treatment of folliculitis is dependent on the infectious cause. So if it's bacterial folliculitis, it is a clinical diagnosis. If it is fungal folliculitis, we can use a KOH preparation. And if it's viral folliculitis, we can do PCR or immunofluorescence. For treatment of bacterial folliculitis, you can use topical treatments like mupirocin or clindamycin or fusidic acid. Depending on if it is MRSA, you might want to use Septra. 
And if it is gram-negative folliculitis, it is self-limiting and proper hygiene is all you need to do. For fungal folliculitis, topical antifungals. If that doesn't work, you may want to move on to oral fluconazole or itraconazole. Never use oral ketoconazole due to the liver toxicity. And dermatophyte folliculitis, you can use oral terbinafine and griseofulvin. With viral folliculitis, it depends on the actual virus that's causing the folliculitis. Herpes folliculitis, acyclovir or valacyclovir, and molluscum folliculitis, cantharidin, and cryotherapy are possible treatments for this condition. So if you want to learn more about other infectious diseases or dermatological conditions, please check out my playlist on those topics. And if you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel. Any and all support is greatly appreciated. And as always, continue to live, laugh, and learn. And I hope to see you next time.